Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Tuesday, March 12th. Derek Van Riper here with Mike Gianella of Baseball Prospectus. Uh, Eno, of course, has an interesting story to tell once he comes back, likely on Wednesday, explaining why he's not here today. But I'm excited because Mike is going to be fantastic. Uh, Mike's someone I played against in the industry leagues, labor, TGFBI, Towers for probably, I don't know, a decade or so now. We, we go back kind of a long way now. Yeah, it's it's been about a decade, maybe like eight years, but yeah, it's been a long time. And and you and I are in labor this year together, so we're we're back competing against each other. Unfortunately, because you're a very good player. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not fun to play against. Maybe I'm fun to draft with for like you know the entertainment purposes or the camar- camaraderie, the chatter. Uh, but yeah. A lot of a lot of good stuff here that we're going to break down. We're going to talk about some news. A lot of news happened since we last uh, had the show on Friday, and of course, the Friday live stream being less news focused, even more stuff has happened. Uh, we have uh, the Discord. A quick reminder: you can sign up for our Discord. I'll put the link for that in the show description. In the Discord, you will find a link to the Listener League, which is open to more than two hundred people. It says two hundred people. There's a limit in each fan tracks contest of two hundred. If it fills, we'll add another one. We'll do as many as we can to keep filling them. It's an open salary cap contest, uh, no entry fee. And uh, the fun prize that we decided on is the top 10 finishers in the overall contest will be invited to a listener league that Eno and I will be a part of for 2025. So uh, very cool, random prize that we decided to put together just to make this fun. Something we can all do together. I like I like formats that are open where you can have possibly hundreds or even thousands of people all kind of competing to uh to go up against each other. But we begin today with some news from Yankees camp. Garrett Cole was sent for an MRI, and I just saw before we started recording, Mike, they're not expecting him to be back for opening day. The MRI was on his elbow. The results have not been shared yet. It sounds like they're going to take a few more days, get a few more opinions, which isn't exactly what you want to hear, right? We've done this long enough where you get a sense of where the news might be headed based on what people are saying or what people aren't saying. Aaron Boone met with the media on Tuesday. The fact that they didn't have a full update from the MRI yet seems pretty ominous at this point. Yeah, it's not good news. Like Even if it's inflammation or or something on the low end, I I have to think they're going to be cautious with him, both because of the contract and because of his his stature. If I had to guess, I'd I'd say he's going to miss a month on the conservative side. I mean, I, I don't have more information than you do, but... I would just play it very cautiously with him right now. Yeah, a lot of times you can take advantage of the opportunity that comes with the uncertainty. When there was a little bit of uncertainty about Ronald Acuna Jr.'s knee, it felt like, hey, there's a chance if you're drafting second or third in this little window where we don't know what's going on, you might get Acuna at a spot where you ordinarily wouldn't. I would not take that same kind of risk right now with Garrett Cole. He'd have to fall several rounds for me to even think about it right now because the possibility of a long-term absence is very, very real based on what we're seeing right now. Uh, the Yankees also may have to bring in another pitcher if Cole's going to miss a lot of time. Blake Snell, of course, still out there. So a lot of rumors about that being a possibility. Aaron Judge sent for an MRI as well. This on his abdomen. I didn't realize Judge was really dealing with anything until I saw this note pop up on Rotowire. Um, I love Judge. I, I think he's one of those players that people usually unfairly ding for past injuries. This may create a buying opportunity, but I'm having a hard time making heads and tails of what's going on here. Apparently, he's not going to swing a bat until later in the week after having this MRI on Monday. So it's a little bit more of a a holding pattern for now, but it doesn't seem nearly as bad as what we're dealing with with Garrett Cole, right? This almost sounds like an oblique type injury, something that could be a month or so for Judge, and he'd probably come back from it if it even takes that long. Yeah, so he's had oblique issues before. That's kind of the one thing I'd be careful with him. Like that being said, you're right. Like the projections generally have him really high, like third or fourth overall in a roto format. So if you're pushing him down, I feel like the discount's already baked in and you don't really need to push him down that much further. But if you do draft Judge, what it comes down to is you kind of have to have a plan, like either on reserve or later in the draft or some other outfielders. Yeah, yeah, just have, have have a little extra depth in case he does end up missing some time. Uh, we'll wait for more information on that and, of course, follow up once we actually have something. Uh, with more clarity, we learned going into the weekend, Noel v. Marte was suspended 80 games for a positive PED test. And I think of all the depth charts in the league, 
there are two that people have been wrestling with this entire winter, Mike. One is the Reds. The other is the Orioles. Unfortunately, Marte is going to miss half the season. Fortunately, we get some more clarity. As you look at the moving parts on this team, who do you have as sort of the biggest playing time winners as a result of Marte's extended absence in Cincinnati? I don't know if they have a big winner. Um, I, I just sort of like everybody on that depth chart. Like I have it in front of me right now. Um, I think we knew that Candelaria was going to play because of the contract, but it might open up some time for Spencer Steer to be more of a true utility player and, and get some games in the infield. Probably Jonathan India is the big winner. I know that sounds weird because at one point, you know, India was just such a top prospect in his own right. It just really seems to mean to me that if he's healthy, I know it's a big question with him and a lot of players on the Reds, that he'll, he'll play. But but I'm probably going to bump up a lot of those infielders like a dollar or two in my bid limits over at Baseball Prospectus and move them up maybe like about half a round to a round, depending on the player. I, I, I feel like it's a win for, you know, outside of the obvious players on that team, it's a win for everybody. And even Tyler Stevenson. Tyler Stevenson, I was a little bit worried, wasn't going to DH like he's done in the past for, for the Reds. I see him doing that now. I see him getting some reps at DH, and I think that helps him a little bit. Yeah, so when you start to look at the way it shakes out, if you had less than a full share of playing time for Christian and Carnacion Strand previously, I think you can nudge him up closer to a full share, at least for the first half of the season. And by the time you get Marte back, mm -hmm. so much could change. You could have a midseason trade. You could have multiple injuries. Like, I almost feel like projecting the playing time beyond Marte's absence is not even worthwhile. Someone could play poorly and lose their spot. Like, there's a whole bunch of ways this whole situation can play out. I'm with you that Candelario all along, because of the money they gave him, felt like he was already a max volume player. India was a pretty good bargain in drafts for most of draft season. I don't think that's even going to change. I mean, I'm looking at the min pick just in March for the, the NFBC 12 teamers is 222. It's not at all cost prohibitive for a guy that really can help you across the board in every category and now seemingly will be closer to that that everyday role um, steer in particular is a guy that i have not drafted at all yet this winter i'm curious what you think about steers skills in general like do you buy into him as a guy that will because of his versatility play enough and then come through and repeat something at least close to what he did in 2023 I don't think he's going to repeat, my, but my concern with him was mostly playing time. I felt like if he slipped a little with all that volume, he'd slip a lot. So now that I look at him, if he puts up 2010 or so in a full season in that lineup with the run and RBI opportunities, I like him. Like I, I feel like he, he's going to do enough and he's versatile enough that you can, you know, as you pointed out, Derek, move him around. I'm still probably fading him a little bit on his ADP, but not nearly so much anymore. And I'm a little less afraid and you know, could see taking him in like the eighth round or so, maybe the ninth. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a, a better case for Spencer Steer now than there was when we were trying to fit Marte into the first half playing time picture. Because Marte looked like a priority play for the Reds. Like even if it wasn't full playing time, it was going to be three out of every four games, he was going to be in the lineup because there's power, there's speed. Uh, Long-term, still someone I really like, but just a kind of a frustrating outcome here if you have already drafted and have a few shares of Novi Marte on your rosters. Uh, more MRI news. Edward Cabrera sent for an MRI on his shoulder, and the diagnosis, I believe, in this one has now been revealed to be an impingement. So not... Not like real bad, could be a lot worse, not a tear. Uh, but I think with Cabrera, one thing that I've always worried about with him is it's not just the walks. It is a pretty lengthy injury history as he made his way through that Marlin system, missed a lot of time with various arm injuries. Uh, getting a full season from him has always seemed like a little bit of a stretch. So even if he figures it all out, and he's certainly putting together a nice spring, 5Ks, no walks in five innings so far, I do have reservations about the volume and this sort of gives us that, oh yeah, that's always part of the package with Edward Cabrera, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, you know, the one thing I'll say in his favor, his ADP, and I'm, I don't have the most recent numbers in front of me, it's so low that I, I can't be too concerned. Like he feels like a pitcher that, you know, in, in a league with liberal reserve moves, you can drop pretty easily. But yeah, that's the other side of it. If you were moving him up because the stuff's electric, he's exciting. You know, he, he's that pitcher. You watch him for six innings and you think, oh boy, like I have to have him on my team when he's at his best. Mm -hmm. But so much can go wrong with him. 
and and there's so many pitchers on on the Marlins too, like in, on the depth chart that it'd be pretty easy to see him go on the IL as a precautionary measure and disappear for a couple months. Yeah, yeah, they've got a ton of depth right now. I mean, they make sense as a team that could easily use a six man rotation because you've got Yuri Perez as someone you're going to limit. Jesus Lazardo has had some injury issues in the past. Braxton Garrett's been banged up this spring. Cabrera's had the lengthy injury history. They're stretching AJ Puck out. He continues to have a really nice spring. You know, Trevor Rogers coming off an injury. Max Myers coming back from Tommy John. Um, none of those guys, other than Lazardo, really project to have full air quotes workloads where they'd be out there for 30 plus starts this season. So if they go with the six man rotation, I think it would it would really like fit them well. Uh, are you finding that you are generally in on many of these Marlins pitchers, though? Because the cost isn't really much of a problem. I mean, for for as exciting as Yuri Perez is, his ADP for now sits right around pick 75. I think that's actually somewhat manageable. Lizardo goes up in that same kind of range. And then you get that big drop before you get down to Garrett in the 250 range. Cabrera goes a little after that in most rooms. Puck goes a little after that. Rogers kind of goes in that same tier. Uh, Meyer looked really good in his first spring outing. I haven't seen him pitch since then, but is there anyone in this group that you really are, are trying to target right now? No, although maybe I should be. I, I, you know, Puck is somebody I'm just reacting to his spring training and his ability and, you know, the, the reports on him have been glowing. I probably should be grabbing more of him in some of my leagues. And Rogers is another one just based on price. Nice guy to pick up. Like if, if he's anything close to what he was, great. Like you got a bargain. If not, he's a pretty easy drop. Probably the two at the top. It's just one of those weird draft things, right? Like I like Lizardo. I just haven't gotten him anywhere just based on where my draft position's been. Because, you know, he comes up, I'm like, ooh, he looks good. And then he's gone. Like somebody took him a few picks before me. Um, my, my awareness with Perez is just the innings. You know, just the idea that if he only pitches 110, 120 innings, I feel like at that price, and yes, I know innings are lower now, you're just kind of losing a little something there at that ADP. I don't doubt the ability, though. Like, he he could be great. Yeah, I think within that tier, you do give up innings with a lot of the pitchers you're thinking about, but not all of them. And uh, depending on what you've done with your rotation at that point, especially, it could be pretty risky. I, I've talked a lot about if I have Tarek Skubal as my ace, I'm not necessarily going after Yuri Perez as my number two. I, I want to make sure that I'm getting enough innings from my top three, top four pitchers as a group, as opposed to um, you know just chasing the guys I want. There's a, there's a reason for combining the guys I like together in certain ways we'll get into that a little bit more as we talk about some draft strategy uh, later on in the show i uh, want a quick follow-up note here from the red sox lucas giolito will have an elbow surgery they did not specify if it's internal brace or a second tommy john so we'll await to see if they actually clarify that at some point here in the coming days but a very lengthy absence expected for giolito not a surprise of course based on uh, where that news was headed just a few days ago um, some good news Sonny Gray progressing from his hamstring injury. Uh, he was able to throw a bullpen session Monday, had no problems with that. So they're going to give him a longer bullpen session on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, it wasn't quite a max effort uh, bullpen session on Monday, but this seems like a situation we've been in before with Sonny Gray, Mike. And part of the reason you get a discount most years is because he's another one of those guys that has had a very difficult time delivering full workloads year after year after year. But the results, especially since he's gotten out of Cincinnati, have been fantastic these last two seasons. Yeah, and I mean, he had that time with the Yankees, too, which wasn't good. But you're right. Beyond that, like he, he was a mainstay on a couple of my teams last year. Uh, he, he's just reliable. You know what you're going to get. The strikeouts aren't going to be, be great, but he just goes like every fifth or sixth day. He, he's projectable. Yes, the ERA last year was kind of a fluke but you're probably looking at a mid threes pitcher with solid ratios who's should give you like 28 to 30 starts and it's kind of what we talked about before with you were talking about with the innings which is yes he's not going to give you 180 190 innings 90 innings but who will so if he misses two mm -hmm. or three starts over the course of the year gives you 150 160 that's more than fine yeah, I've seen a couple of, of leagues where he's fallen pretty far. ADP in March in those 12-team leagues, it's around pick 140. Very reasonable price, even with this injury. 
Uh, I think he threw 20 pitches in that bullpen session on Monday. There's a possibility that he's not completely stretched out when the season begins. Sometimes you do have guys who avoid the IL, but they have a restriction. They throw 65, 70 pitches in their first start. If that were the case, Mm -hmm. I think I'd still be fine with Gray in my lineup in the first week for most deeper leagues, at least. I mean, I I don't I don't know. I I like the skills a lot, and I think the team context is very favorable. Um, He's the only Cardinals starting pitcher that I actually like right now. And I think you're getting a very fair price in part because of this seemingly mild injury. Uh, here's a situation that popped up and seemingly got a lot worse very quickly. Devin Williams is visiting with a spine specialist. He's already had an MRI. Initially, they were kind of downplaying this and saying it's nothing serious. But when you send someone to a spine specialist, <laughs> I'm generally going to uh, put the red caution sign up and say, hey, this is possibly a really big deal. Um, so second opinion coming this week. Don't know what that's going to reveal just yet. They have been really careful with him this spring. I think he's only appeared in two Cactus League games so far. Uh, the big question really is, in Milwaukee, who do you like as the next option up for saves if Devin Williams is going to end up missing some time? Because it was Joel Piamps at the beginning of last year in the setup role. He kind of faded to more of a seventh inning role. They brought up Abner Uribe. He's really young. He's electric. Didn't necessarily take over a high leverage spot, even though he was occasionally used in those situations. There's Trevor McGill, who was just a filthy option for them over the course of the year as well. Uh, who stands out to you as maybe the most likely to emerge as Williams' replacement? It's probably Piomps, but you're right. Like there, there isn't a reliever here that necessarily stands out. I, I did grab Piomps before this injury news in an NL only at a buck, but that was really just more for volume and innings and and quality. Um, McGill, I've seen higher up on the depth charts. This, this really feels like a situation where you don't know. And if you're in a draft that's going on right now, I feel like you take one of these relievers on reserve and just kind of cross your fingers. And if it's a slow draft and you already took Williams, that, that's that's really what you do. You take McGill, mm-hmm. you take Piops, maybe even take Uribe, who, you know, the, the skills are off the charts. And if you get a closer, great. If you don't, you, you just move on in week one. Yeah, I, I've always tried to use proximity to the ninth inning as my my next man up sort of mentality the problem i think is you got a new manager in pat murphy you've had a long-term capital c closer in milwaukee going back to josh Hader probably three or four years ago shifting exclusively into that role williams just sort of took the torch and has been phenomenal ever since so the seats next to those guys have been very fluid but as an organization They've shown a consistent ability to find and tweak and develop really good high leverage relievers. So, you know, the next person up could take the job and run with it while Williams is out, at least. It could, they may be able to avoid the dreaded committee, but I'm with you. Like, I follow this team really closely, and I don't think there's a case against any one of those three guys. I don't think there's any clarity at the moment as to who that option really is. But interesting that uh, Piamps was the guy you drafted that last opportunity. I think if you had if you had three kicks in the can and you wanted to get one of each, <laughs> I don't think you'd necessarily be wrong. You'll only be, only be right one time in that instance, or you could be wrong all three times if there's a, a fourth candidate there that we're not even talking about right now. That's always fun when that plays out that way. Uh, but this is worth watching for sure because uh, this this seems like a, an IL stint is almost certainly going to be there for Devin Williams at the beginning of the year, at least. Uh, this one caught me by surprise. Going back to the Reds for a minute on the pitching side, Frankie Montas is getting the opening day nod. And maybe this is just the, the way the schedule worked out. But these things are usually planned far in advance. Like you kind of know who you want your opening day started to be and you have them pitch their first spring game based on that. And it's just mapped out so they land on opening day. But I would have assumed Hunter Green was the opening day starter. I don't think this means a lot, but I do feel like we haven't talked a lot about Montas on this show over the course of draft season. This is a guy that's had a lot of success in the past. It was in a pitcher-friendly environment in Oakland. A lot of success might be a little bit of a stretch, but 2019 in a half season, 2021 in a full season, those were really good years with good ratios, lots of strikeouts. Kind of a bumpy patch once he got to the Yankees. He was also hurt for most of last season. What have you been doing with Frankie Montas in your draft so far this season? Probably nothing. Like he, I have him listed, but I just haven't been taking him. And I'll admit it, I've probably overlooked him because of the injury history, because of the idea that I've mostly been doing NFBC-type drafts, whether it's TGFBI or something else. 
and I'm looking at him like, well, if I need to replace him early, there's no IL. Uh, he, he's definitely somebody in a league with IL spots you you should be drafting because even if he pitches a month, gets hurt, then comes back in two or three months, you could get 60 or 70 really solid innings out of him. So I, I'll admit, like, I've, I've kind of whiffed on him so far. Like, he, he's somebody who should be – you should be thinking about it at the very least at the back end of your drafts and even in a standard mix, quite honestly, where you can always drop him. Yeah, yeah. I think he goes late enough you could absolutely – Throw the dart. If you're not happy with what you see, let him go. Pulling up the ADP here again real quick. Right around pick 300. That's the range. And uh, I think we've discussed this before. Great American Ballpark, as difficult as it is overall, I mean, it boosts homers. That's the main problem. It's not impossible. We've seen pitchers fare pretty well there. I mean, Sonny Gray was okay there. Johnny Cueto back in the day was very good there. Luis Castillo. It's not impossible to be a good pitcher with that as your home park. It's not Coors even though it is a difficult place to deal with. And I think with Montas, the other thing that makes me kind of intrigued by him from a skills perspective is he can get that ground ball rate to a slightly elevated place. When things are going really well, he's got that splitter. That can help him keep the ball on the ground. So maybe he won't get bit as much by that park as some people will think. Right? He doesn't have that heavy, heavy fly ball tendency when everything is working. Uh, the other Reds news item, Matt McClain playing in spring games. He was dealing with that oblique injury that was kind of bothering him at the end of last season. Good news that he seems to be on track to be ready for opening day. Jordan Lawler got sent down to AAA, Mike. And I got a, a kind of a broader question for you uh, just about prospects in redraft leagues. Like, how do you approach guys that are not going to be on the opening day roster? I mean, I think by ADP, most people expected sometime at triple a for jordan lawler and there's a lot of players that kind of fit this description pete crow armstrong got sent down by the cubs recently are these players generally undraftable in the nfbc style leagues you talked about or do you find that you can actually get away with stashing one or possibly two early on in the season if you build your roster correctly my my rule is probably one and it generally is after their ADP, which means I, I might not get one and I'm fine with that. Like someone I find myself drafting is more like Kyle Mazzardo just because he's going late enough. And I've noticed his price falling where it's like, OK, if I get Mazzardo and he gets sent down, fine. I, I think there's still a chance he might make the team. But really, it, I, I like to take the player late because there's that idea that if you take somebody and say the 20, even the 20th round, and you know he's he's there for a month in the minors, and you've got needs. Like all of a sudden, you feel like ooh, like I have an investment in this player. Whereas if you take somebody late, like twenty fifth round or later, it's pretty easy to drop the player because psychologically you feel well, okay, he's not going to work out. I can pick him back up later. It's a long season, and FBC is tough too in leagues like that because you need those pitching slots, especially early. You really need to churn through to play matchups. It's difficult to hold on to a prospect unless it's someone like you know Junior Camonero, for example, who you look at like this player is so good that I can hold on to for a month and, and see what happens. Yeah, I, I think the price is really really key in all of this, and I. I'm willing to take on risks. I mean, I I, I think guys like Wyatt Langford and, and Jackson Churio, before they hit that last jump sometimes, and Wyatt Langford has hit it recently. We talked about it last week. You can get in. You can feel okay about the price because the likelihood of them being everyday players is actually pretty high. And even if you're wrong in the eighth or the ninth round, you can live to tell the tale of missing with a pick in that range. But when you start to talk about fourth and fifth round for guys like that, they get that late bump, then it becomes almost impossible to, for me at least, to draft them at that price, even though I believe in them and know they're good. I mean, I've missed out. I missed out on Bobby Witt Jr.'s rookie season a couple of years ago because the price just became too much. And and sometimes you're going to have guys that crank out a 20 plus dollar season and someone else gets a little bit of value. But other times, like those guys don't make money for you in that draft slot it does actually become cost prohibitive and it becomes smart to avoid them the late dart prospects make a lot of sense the guys that haven't been sent down yet especially i think they're totally fine because as you said it's easy to cut bait on someone you drafted especially in the last five rounds like you you generally at least i go in to a 15 team league like that expecting most of those guys to be cut Maybe even at the first fab, depending on how early we're drafting. I'm just trying to take the what could go right sort of angle with players like that. 
I think I've got Lawler on at least one roster so far. I thought there was a chance he'd make the opening day roster. I think this is a pretty good reminder, though. They do like Geraldo Perdomo a lot, even though Perdomo doesn't do all the things from a stat cast perspective that we all get excited about as analysts. He's a good real life player. They like him as their shortstop. Maybe they're not ready to move him into a utility role yet. Maybe they want to give Jordan Lawler some time to play another position at AAA and break him in somewhere else or break Lawler in as a super utility player. I mean, there's a, a lot of ways this could play out. But as it stands right now with Lawler specifically, I don't think I'm drafting him in leagues that have the seven bench spots where, where stashing is tough. I think I would take a shot on a Menzardo or someone else. I mean, even Jordan Westberg, who I really like, I, I think... There's a much better chance Westberg stays up and even has a spot to call his own in a crowded Orioles infield than uh, than Lawler is going to get a quick call up. Like it's going to take an injury now for Lawler to come up and be an everyday guy for this Diamondbacks team in April. Yeah, the the other thing I'd say too is I, I know it was a small sample, but he did struggle last year in the majors, and 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 that's part of it. Like I'm I'm sure if he had gone like 15 for 30 instead of four for 30 or whatever it was, they might have looked at it differently he did look like he needed a little like just a little bit of the finishing touches so i would guess june for lawler i have no inside information but if you're looking at june it, it's just kind of tough to hang on to a player like that in the league without a lot of reserve slots yeah i mean we're talking about a guy that just turned 21 last july only spent uh, 16 games at triple a before getting that 14 game late season call up to arizona so uh, i think they're justified in their willingness to send him down give him a bit more time uh, K rate was high last year when he debuted in that small sample, and he was striking out a little bit again this spring, right? I mean, I think the process stats do matter as far as guys that are on the margins making those kinds of decisions if someone is actually ready or not. Um, but it's someone I like from a really, uh, I like a lot from a long term perspective, even though I'm not necessarily in, in redraft. I think the exception would be an NL only league. Of course, in an NL only league, I'll take that chance, especially if it's like a dollar or two and I can find someone else to fill that spot for the first part of the season because the payoff could be nice down the road once Lawler finally gets that opportunity. Uh, a couple other injury items to pass along. One more, at least. Gavin Williams nursing an elbow issue. This one's a bummer, Mike, because I really like Gavin Williams. I, I obviously believe in the Guardians' ability to develop pitching. They've done it for so long. There's, there's no reason not to, but I thought we were on the brink of, of maybe getting a full season close to what we saw last year, but maybe even with better whip from Gavin Williams. He had a 329 ERA and a 126 whip, 81 Ks and 82 innings. I thought the stuff was good enough for him to take one more step, and maybe it still is, but this is a case where I think the Guardians are going to be extra careful. It's a young pitcher. There's no reason to push him too hard. So even if it's not a serious injury, I think I would expect the longer end of whatever timetable they eventually put out there. Yeah, I agree. And I, I liked him too. I was fine with him as a ADP and I'm not off him completely, but he would really have to fall like for me, for me to grab him. Do you happen to have where his ADP is in recent drafts? Yeah. The, the most recent window 229 is the max now. So I would say, you know, the ADP is oh, at 162 just for all of March. I would bet if we slice that down to like the last three days, since this news popped up on Sunday, you're going to find that even lower, 179. Yeah, so he's slipping a little bit, probably closer to pick 200 now on average. Pretty good bargain. Yeah, and that's what I'm looking at. I'm probably looking at him out. Yeah, I'm probably looking at him outside the t- top 200. And you're right, it, it's a good bargain if, if that's where he falls and if he's healthier, it's a minor thing. But I, I just feel really reluctant when I hear elbow to, to push him past that. Absolutely. J.D. Davis released by the Giants. So uh, <laughs> opportunity for someone else to uh, pick up a power bat that probably fits better at first base and DH than at third base, even with a few improvements that made him well less terrible at third base. I mean, I think it's it's it feels rude, but he was better than people expected, even though he still didn't grade out particularly well at third base. There's a good story. Well, I mean, a frustrating story, but a good story written by Andrew Baggerly, too, that the Giants actually got off the hook for a lot of that salary because of a loophole in the CBA. But we'll spare you the details of that here. Be sure to check that out over on The Athletic. Mike, let's get to uh, mixed labor. You and I went up against each other in this draft, and there's a lot of interesting ways to to break it down. It's been a few weeks since we built these teams. I made a board so people can actually uh, follow along if they're watching on YouTube. We'll put the link to the results in the show description. So if you want to click on that and kind of check these things out uh, as we're talking about them, that may be maybe a helpful thing to do. But you had the uh, 13th seat 
in this room, 15 team league. Uh, I think it's 29 man rosters. I got the first 24 rounds on the screen for those of you who are watching on YouTube. And I'm curious, first and foremost, how much do you like being in the back of the draft order for this year, just based on the way the player pool is shaping up? I didn't like it at all. Uh, so something I like in the first round is trying to get that speed and power together, uh, particularly in an average league. And that's really difficult to do at the back end of the first round without giving something up. Like, yes, and he went in this draft, but Jose Ramirez is typically there, but he's, he's kind of mm-hmm. fell off a little bit last year. And I'm a little worried about him not being like a 30 to 35 steel player. And then you really have to make decisions, right? So, so you really, if you want to take speed at the back end of the first round, you have to give something else up and you really have to push on a player like say Francisco Lindor, who I, I like a lot. I just don't like him in the first round. So I, I don't like it back here. I also don't like like pre-injury. This is where Garrett Cole is kind of lurking as a viable pick. Um, and if you don't take a starter, which is what I did in this draft in the first two rounds, I feel like you have to kind of give something up on starting pitching. So yeah, I, I, I don't like the back end this year. Um, I mean, I like my team. I think I did fine with it, but I, I would have preferred to be in the middle or closer to the front where you were. So you started with Judge and Riley, so you did have to kind of lean into the no speed approach. And I think what what is interesting about every start is you have to give up something. You're going to be chasing something, relatively speaking. Your your early middle rounds are going to be kind of making up ground in some categories. Uh, for you, it was speed. On the pitching side, I guess it ended up being saves. That's not atypical, though, right? If you go hitter, hitter, pitcher, pitcher, a lot of times outside of the NFBC especially, that's going to be two starters rather than a closer getting pushed all the way into that range. Have you been comfortable taking early closers in the 3-4 range when you have that later position? Because that's like the first couple of closers off the board. Edwin Diaz went to Jenny Butler at the pick after you. It was was kind of wild. This particular room, you had Jenny Butler and Paul Sporer 14th and 15th, and they both double-tapped closers at the three, four turn. So after you took yeah. Freddie Peralta as your first pitcher, they went Edwin Diaz, Josh Hader, Emmanuel Classe, and Joan Duran. Uh, was there any chance that any one of those four closers was there? You would have taken them over Logan Webb, or was it a priority for you to make sure you got a lot of high quality innings with the two starters? I the answer is probably not. Like I, I will say, like psychologically, when I saw those closers going, if one of Diaz, Hader, or Duran had been there. I might have taken one just to join the run and be like, I have to get one. Uh, but generally, no. And some of this is the difference between NFBC, um, you know, TGFBI and NFBC type league. I did take Diaz. I'm, I'm, I was in the 14th slot there in my bracket. I did take Diaz in the third round. So I'm not afraid to do it when there's an overall component. I just don't like pushing closers up in this league. I I feel like from a valuation standpoint, you're giving something up. And most importantly, you don't have to win every category. Like you you can come, you know, in in third place in every category and still in most 15 team leagues, you can still win in a roto format. And, you know, I don't know if the closers I got will do, do that. But I just felt like it was giving up too much value with most of these picks to to kind of push up closers. And the other problem, too, is, you know, once I waited, you know, when you look at the rest of the board, the closers that a lot of people like, obviously, were all going. So it's that thing where it's like, well, yeah, sure, I'd like to take a closer early, but I don't really want to surrender, you know, the value on that next pick and then that next pick. Um, Albert Alzale, who I I took, I, I think, in the 10th round. That was kind of my plan was like, okay, I'm not going to wait forever. I'm not going to dump the category. This is where I'll take my first closer. And I think he's fine. Like he's sort of on the back end of that large circle of trust this year. You know, it's not like, you know, Finnegan or Lange or one of those closers where it's like, oh, gee, like I I can't believe like this is my first closer. Um, But you're right. Like it it certainly isn't one of the high end closers that you're you're shooting for. Yeah, I think the important thing is that so many people that listen to shows and watch our shows, They don't play in the NFPC. They play in other leagues. In most other leagues, you can trade. In labor, you can trade. So if you have a categorical weakness and someone else has that strength, you can line up and make a deal pretty easily, right? So you have that afforded to you. And 
in a standalone league of any kind, NFBC or not, as long as there's no overall component, you don't necessarily have to have as much categorical balance as we're always talking about when we're looking at more of those NFBC style formats as well. So I think it's fine to you know, have a have a thing that you you're waiting for to have that be saves. You don't have to commit an overwhelming amount of fab budget to get saves in a situation like this. Whereas I feel like if you use this build in the NFBC, you will drain a lot more fab than you'd like trying to find those relievers. More likely than not. I think Alzale is pretty good as a kind of a last chance, likely to be the guy so long as he's healthy closer. It usually goes kind of in the same range as Kenley Jansen. Usually it's a little bit after Clay Holmes and a few other guys that have sort of similar skills. So makes sense where he goes for sure. Um, so I like the way you, you executed this strategy. And I think when you when you went Peralta Webb, you gave yourself more flexibility for those next five or six picks. You could kind of do whatever you wanted because you had enough pitching. You had two legit big bats. I think the only thing you really had to think about was making sure you got enough speed with the next few hitters that you put together, right? That, that became the priority. As soon as you started judging Riley, the next thing on your mind had to be, all right, I got to get 25 to 30 bags from a couple of hitters before the hitters like that sort of dry up, or at least before the the good hitters like that completely dry up. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think I might actually still be a little light on speed. I mean, to your point, it is it is a trading league, um, but but I might be a speedster short. But so I got Jazz Chisholm in the fifth round. I was hoping to get either Chisholm or or Josh Lowe. What, what's tricky about Lowe is that Tim McLeod was on the wheel on the other end and he likes his guys, and he, he's somebody who's not afraid to jump ADP, and he did that on on Josh Lowe, which is fine. Like I, I think you should do that, especially if you're on the wheel. Um, but I, I like Chisholm where I got him. And then Matt McClain, uh, I, I kind of got the dip on the injury news with him. I wasn't expecting to get him. He wasn't a target, but he went just outside of pick 100, and he's not a major speedster, but he should steal 20 bases conservatively, You know, assuming everything's okay with him health-wise. And I was really pleased to be able to kind of backfill on the speed with with those two picks. Yeah, I think I think that turned out really well. And McLean was a nice value where he landed. Uh, Jazz was someone I was thinking about in round five. I, I took Nico Horner in that spot. The only reason I didn't take Jazz earlier was because I started to build what I thought was a good batting average foundation. This was the league where I went Spencer Strider, Corbin Burns. I went pocket aces in the first and second round. I felt like Vlad Jr. by a projection made sense at 3-5. We're going to talk a little bit about some projections, flaws or potential flaws in a few minutes um, with Vlad and then Royce Lewis as my first two hitters. I felt like, hey, my batting average might be among the league's best. Let's keep pushing in that direction because if I'm chasing some late speed, I need to have some cushion. Usually when you're chasing something late, you need to have a really strong average kind of built in. I felt like Horner gave me that, whereas Jazz, of all the things he's going to do well, the last thing he's likely to provide us is a good batting average. It's probably 30-30 skills that are legit, but is it going to come with more than like a 240 average? Most likely not. But I really like that pick for you at, uh, at late part of round five because I could see Jazz being healthy this year and, and popping up and going two rounds earlier in drafts this time next year. Yeah, you did identify the biggest problem with my team, though, in my opinion. It is the batting average. Like I don't have a batting average standout. And I have players that I like, like later on, like Dalton Varsho, I really like. Um, I like Nolan Gorman. I'm, I'm, I'm huge on him this year. But I really could have used a batting average anchor. And you know, Lisa, Luisa Rise is somebody I was looking at, um, but he went about a round earlier in, in round 11 um, to, to Rudy Gamble of Rasball. And you know, I, I might have been looking at him at the end of round 11, but at that point, you know, he was gone. And there just really wasn't a hitter to fill that need. So if I do have a weakness, you know, I know the category is variable. Average is where I'm a little bit concerned I'm going to be like in the bottom third of the category as opposed to any higher than that. How far into the season do you have to go before you'd actually consider you know, punting batting average? Like, is it a couple months? Is it... Is it longer than that? Like, wh when are you comfortable saying, "Yeah, all right, maybe I'll I'll shift away from the handful of guys that are really good in that category. I'll trade them away, or I'll take on a few more deadweight players on the waiver wire in that category because it's only going to cost me a standings point or two if I drop, but I can make up ground in homers and runs and RBIs by taking advantage of something that other players might be afraid of. I would say maybe a third of the season, so about fifty games or so. 
Uh, it's a tough category to do much with one way or the other, though. It's, I mean, it's especially a tough category to move up in. So I think after like 40 or 50 games, if I see I'm at or near the bottom, that might be where, like, to your point, I start picking up players who are weak in the category but strong elsewhere, or, you know, maybe reach out to whoever it is who has Kyle Schwarber. I, I hope it's Fred Zinke, but I, I'm just looking at the board now. I'm not sure who it is. But <laughs> whoever has Schwarber, it's like, yeah, I, I might reach out and say, hey, it's, it's time to – you know, offer up a little extra for him if I'm ahead in steals or if my pitching's doing well and, and maybe see if I can add that power and, you know, you know, just suck along with that bad batting average. Yeah, it's funny to me because I, I think you can take advantage of... It's, 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 it's Tim, by the way. Ah, yeah, there you go. So, I mean, you can you can take advantage yeah. of, of players that people are taking at a discount and, like, you still get a discount when you trade for them in most cases because I, I think that that batting average weakness just hangs on to a player's value. I don't know if people do a good job adjusting their in-season valuations enough based on need in that category in particular. So I think if you have if committed to not worrying that much about it, you can still get that value on those players later, be it Schwarber, Max Muncy, um, guys that kind of fit that profile of, hey, they're going to play a lot and they're in good lineups and the power's real and the run production's real. Let's take advantage of the three categories they thrive in and not worry about the one or two categories where they don't offer much because you're getting that from everybody else and you don't necessarily need to get that from those two guys in particular. Uh, I noticed you took Jackson Holiday in this one too. That was like round 15, I think. Do you find it strange that Jackson Holiday, as the best prospect in baseball is available around pick 200 in a world where everybody wants shiny new toys? Like, like every everything Jackson Holiday has done in the minors so far has just been ridiculously good. I mean, I've, are people just afraid that it's too crowded and we'll have to wait longer than we want to for him to get that opportunity with the Orioles? It's a little bit of that. I think people are worried he's going to get sent down or, or struggle and go down, and, and people maybe remember Jared Kelnick and, and are worried about that. But honestly, I think a large part of it is, and, and I know this segues into a future discussion here that we're going to have, People are looking a little bit too much at projections with him. I, I know the projections are really limp. They they show like a 10-10 player and like a, I think 400 or 450 plate appearances or whatever it is. And it really, with a player like Holiday, I'm not suggesting he's going to go 30-30, but it's not difficult to see him doing what Anthony Volpe did last year and, and with a somewhat better batting average. And if I get that outside of pick 200, like a 15-20, 15-25 player who hits 230, at middle infield, I'll I'll take that all day long. Like especially in that lineup where the runs and RBI will be boosted. Um, I I wasn't targeting him. I just saw him here and I was like, you know what? He, he's a player like just kind of worth taking a chance on. And you know, the other thing I did too is I I took Brandon Lau a, a little bit early and just supplemented, being, being like, well, you know what? If if Holiday does go down, I have a replacement. I can just put in for a couple of weeks. He's going to give me something at middle infield. Yeah, I mean, I think with. With Holiday, it's 54 total games above double A, but he's passed every test they've given him so far. If they send him down to triple A, I think he could be called up faster than Jordan Lawler, barring the injury reason to bring either one of those guys up. I think the floor is pretty high. Uh, so I, I want to ask you about this then. What, what leads you to disagree with projections? What types of things do you see either in a player or in a group of players that makes you say, hey, look, projections are wonderful, but... This is an area where the projection might not tell us the whole story. So there, there's a couple players. Uh, you, know, you sent me this question on the rundown. There's a couple players that jumped out to me this year, like in CJ Abrams and Ellie De La Cruz. Like if you look at De La Cruz's projections, he's not going to do that. Like he's not going to hit what is it like 240 with like 35 steals and like I think it's 15 home runs. And I'm I'm just you know averaging them. He's either going to go out and be like the superstar who figures out the strikeouts and, you know, next year we're talking about him, you know, as a first rounder, or he's going to struggle so badly where he gets sent down or they, they start resting him. The projection just sort of is like this middle like baseline that, that I feel tells you like almost nothing. And I get it. And it's a smart way to draft. Like you shouldn't, you know, draft De La Cruz in the first round or the fifth round. You should take him somewhere in the middle of there. And then Abrams is another one. Abrams, I, I think there was real improvement in the second half. Um, he stole at the same pace as Ronald Acuna Jr. in the second half with a much worse on base percentage. And yes, I get all the flaws with Abrams. You know, I've heard people say, you know, that his stack cast page is terrible. And I, I know it 
is, but he's going to play in Washington. He could steal 60 to 70 bases and the projections just have him much lower. Like, and it's a similar thing to De La Cruz. Like he could totally tank. He could steal a ton of bases and really be a bargain in Roto leagues. He's not going to be in the middle. And, And that's what I'm looking at projections. I think some projections take too much of a middle road. There's a good reason for that with boring veterans and, and lots of other players, but with younger players and players who have an erratic path, I think that's where sometimes they're a little bit off. Yeah, I, I found most years that's where my biggest disagreements are. Um, not because, not because that like the projection is is wrong, but it's more because of what you said. Like it's the range of outcomes is more extreme, and you need to decide which of those extremes is more likely to occur, and then you kind of base that on what it costs to get the player to decide if the player makes sense or not. With Abrams. He, he fits into this group of players that I, the speedsters in general seem like they're under projected for stolen bases. Like the run environment in the projections didn't fully capture 2023 or isn't fully buying it as the new normal. And when Eno and I have talked about this, it, it's hard to imagine that teams would run less. It seems almost certain that they're going to run more because the league's success rate was above 80% last year. So, the green light is still on. Like you go until the efficiency drops. So I imagine that many teams sat around this winter and said, wow, we can actually run more than we thought. We have these players that had this many opportunities that they didn't take. We think these players can actually run more. And you're going to see a decent number of teams take more aggressive approaches than they did a year ago. And there's going to be a, an abundance of bags. But you know, we talked about it with Trey Turner before. I think Abrams is a great example of this. How do you go 47 for 51 as a base dealer over a pretty healthy full season, come back with a projection for similar playing time, and end up with fewer steals, especially given his age? He's so young. That's a core skill that C.J. Abrams will have for a long time. The other part of C.J. Abrams that's complicated is he missed a lot of time in the minors with injuries, and he was right in that sweet spot development-wise where he would have played, you know, full season at probably high a in 2020 and there was no 2020 season. So he lost that development time as well. There's supposed to be more power on the way. And we started to see it last year. 167 ISO is pretty good for a 22 year old. He's not small. He's like one of those guys that could add a lot of muscle to his frame, right? And he's listed at six, two. He's kind of, he kind of looks skinny now when you watch him, but it's kind of like early career, like Byron Buxton, where you looked at him and you're like, this guy could get a lot stronger. Early career Carlos Gomez, you could pack on more muscle and get to that power more consistently. So sure. the stack ass numbers kind of steer you one way with CJ Abrams, but scouts and, and kind of the pro- physical projection would give you more reasons to believe in the 18 homers and, and possibly an up arrow in that category long term as well. Yeah, and I, I think that's just in general with the projections. They they tend to see things as flat. And we know generally, like young players, it might not be incremental, but they generally get better. And older players generally, especially as they get into their like mid-30s, decline. And it's something projections struggle with because they're logically looking at a series of numbers from the previous three years. I, I know they bake some of this in. But they probably don't bake it in enough. Like Spencer Torkelson, another another guy I got in, in labor. Um, Robert Orr at Baseball Prospectus, you know, by the way, always read Robert Orr if you're not doing so already. He's he's wonderful. He had a gr- great piece on Torkelson back in August about the improvements he made, about what he was doing. And over the next six weeks, like weeks, Torkelson went out and did the things that that Robert was describing. He's another player the projections still see with like a really low batting average and kind of like, you know, leveling off. It just if Torkelson is kind of like last year's version of Pete Alonso, where he hits 40 home runs, yes, even in that park with a with a bad batting average, it just wouldn't surprise me because players change, like players evolve. Like I hear you and Eno talk about that all the time. Like players are, are constantly learning, they're constantly doing things differently. And that's something projections just often aren't going to catch. And they're not really designed to catch that. They're they're designed to look mostly at at numbers you know, that, that previously occurred and say, okay, this is what we expect to come next. Like there's nothing wrong with the projections. It's just how we use the projections and how sometimes we, we fail to accommodate for those changes. Right. Yeah. I'm, 
to, to clarify, I, I love science and numbers. I'm not I'm not dismissing them as as uh, being without value. I'm I think it comes back to something we've said. It's like you have to understand how the sausage is made, how the projection is made. What what are the limitations, and where can you take advantage of that? And the reason mm-hmm. is, I think the overwhelming majority of people who play are using one of probably four or five sets of projections for their valuations. Some people do their own. Some people use some random set that's less popular. They may have slightly different rankings as a result. But I think you get really similar views of the player pool unless you can find some sort of meaningful way to manipulate your rankings and your valuations to better reflect what's likely to occur. The big variable for me, and I think Jeff Zimmerman was on this several years before me, and maybe you were on this several years before me too, the playing time projections, right? So many people look at fan graphs in particular. Fan graphs rules. I love fan graphs. Support fan graphs. Throw money at fan graphs, mm-hmm. please. Like keep fan graphs alive as long as possible. You have to realize that the playing time adjustments are massive. When you when you find that you disagree in either direction with a playing time projection, that's a huge pivot point for someone that you either like or dislike more than the market. Because many, many people in this game will not adjust playing time themselves. They'll take what's spit out and they'll just run with it. And that's okay. You can play that way. Those are good projections, but they're not perfect. It's the same kind of thing. Where can you find an edge that other people aren't exploiting? And for me, that is one of those places. And I think before the Noel V. Marte suspension, it might have been even worse. But there are some pretty low projected plate appearance totals for Christian Encarnacion Strand. So if you run him through the auction calculator or any sort of draft software with a similarly low plate appearance projection, it's going to bring everything down. It's going to bring his homers, his runs, his RBIs down. It's going to make him less valuable. If you think that's wrong, if you think he's a 600 plate appearance player, you got to scale him up, bump him up a couple of rounds. That's the kind of player you would take at or slightly above cost consistently because you have a clear reason why the market is flat out wrong about that player. Yeah, the other thing too about projections is I've I've often found this. If you just go off projections, especially in a sharp room of people, look in in your local league, if you're playing with a bunch of people who don't follow projections, you can just take a projection list and probably win, you know, nine times out of 10. In a sharp league, you're going to finish third or fourth doing that just because you need the variance. Like, you know, getting back to Holiday, one of the reasons I took him is I feel like you need to hit like an 80th or 90th percentile projection on one or two players like that at the back end of your draft to win a sharp league. It, it's really difficult not to do that. I'm not saying you should make every pick like that. I know there's main event players who, you know, they boring is good. Like boring is often good. Following the projections is good. But you need to take three or four hits, I'd say, outside of pick like 200 that you're rolling the dice, that you're like, I hope this player really like, you know, goes over the projection. And with a player like Holiday, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for pedigree. You're looking for, you know, the scouting, the makeup, like people love him. You know, he's, he's got his, you know, his dad, Matt has that off season compound. And I think it's in Oklahoma that like major leaguers have gone to be like, Oh my gosh, like this place is amazing. Like this is where you get to train. Um, (laughs) And this isn't just about holiday. Like you're, you're, you're looking for three or four players like that who, you know, have that like, you know, ability to really outshine the, the projection based on where they're going. I think the other tricky part of this too is like you want to absorb as much information as possible. Hitters and pitchers are always making adjustments. Pitchers are working on new pitches. They're throwing in front of machines. They're adding spin. They're adding new secondary stuff. They're adding velo, right? They're they're changing their grips. They're always doing something. And some of it matters and some of it doesn't. And trying to determine what stuff matters and what stuff doesn't is very tough. Uh, another example on the hitting side, Brett Beatty. I really like Brett Beatty just from the simple fact that he hits the ball hard. In 2022, he was the best hitter at double A by WRC plus. So he was age appropriate, even a little young for the level was the best player there. All he really needs to do is hit the ball in the air more consistently to unlock power. It's an oversimplification, but that's generally what, if if he does that more power will come. And the thing about Beatty, that's interesting. uh, Will Salmon, who covers the the Mets for the athletic tipped me off to this video. He did a breakdown on SNY with Todd zeal. He was explaining the changes that he made this off season. 
he's trying to fix his top hand, trying to make an adjustment to kind of fix a hole where down and in pitches in the zone, usually lefties crush that ball. Brett Beatty hasn't so far, and he's trying to make some mechanical adjustments to basically take a pitch that he should drive in the air and start driving it in the air. And I'm getting excited watching this. I'm like, all right, I already like this guy. And it seems like he's making the exact adjustment that he has to make to be a better version of himself. I almost wonder if sometimes I can go too far in the other direction. Like it's good to have that information in your back pocket, but can you, can you overcorrect based on information? It's a hard game. You could make that change. Brett Beatty can make that swing change. It might cost him something. It might create a hole. He might, he might have something else that he's not doing as well. Right. So like, that's the other part of the, the information battle that I'm like wrestling with on a regular basis as I'm trying to figure out how to adjust player values. Yeah, and and what's really tough too in a case like Beatty, it, it, it's very easy, especially this time of year, to take every piece of information and overreact because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for an edge. We're looking for like the rundown we went through at the beginning. You're you're looking for that news where it's like, ooh, I don't want to overpay. I, I don't want to get get stuck with a player or an injury or a problem. But it works the other way. Like we we're, we're too often, you know, thinking, ooh, I love Brett Beatty. I like Beatty too, by the way, but. Yeah, we, we want to be careful not to go too far in the other direction. Be like, okay, I'm going to jump him, you know, three or four rounds based on this news, and then kind of find out he's mostly the same player, you know, on a team that might not be going anywhere this year. Right. Yeah. So it can it can work against you too, but I think you do want to find your various reasons for uh, kind of pushing back on projections because that is going to lead you to different builds, and I think zigging when everyone else zags. I, I've heard Scott Pianowski say that for years, multiple fantasy sports. There's something to be said about using a different strategy than everybody else in the room. I think in, in DFS, a lot of times it's it's leverage, right? It's just having the advantage over the pool because you have a combination that most people don't have. You used a different build. Um, what I noticed, I did the pocket aces thing in labor draft that we did. I'll pop the board up again real quick just so we can kind of look at it. But I was in the fifth spot. I went Strider Burns. And what I noticed was once I got into that round four through six range, round four through seven even, I was looking at completely different hitters than I am when I start hitter pitcher or hitter hitter. It just twists the player pool in a completely different direction. And many other people near me in this room started hitter hitter. I think of the four people who were drafted in front of me, only one, Jeff Erickson, drafted a pitcher in the first two rounds. And I think Timmy McLeod was the only one who had a pitcher in the first three rounds. So I had just a totally different looking build throughout. And even other teams throughout the draft board, like usually there's only one or two rosters that go pocket aces the way I would define it, where it's two of your first three picks are starting pitchers. Ideally, yeah, your first two. But I think two of the first three would also count. So what it did is it just pushed me into this group of players that I haven't really rostered anywhere else like Royce Lewis uh Nico Horner those two guys are on I think only one other roster for me that's just Lewis who I've drafted after I got him in labor and I, I kind of like the idea of shopping in a different bin because when everybody else is chasing some of the high ceiling sp2s the Bobby Millers the Grayson Rodriguez is the Yuri Perez is if you're shopping for hitters you're not worried about that group of players. You're not getting FOMO because you you missed out on some of those guys. You already took care of your pitching and you're doing something completely different. And I found something about that to be somewhat refreshing, I guess, of, of having this build that was just sort of unique. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at your board too. Like what the other thing it allowed you to do. So so I tend to try to take three starters, like whether I'm doing pocket aces or not, like in the first seven or eight rounds in a league like this. It allowed you to wait until the 13th round to take you Darvish as your third starter. And given how high end your first two starters out are, your your rotation looks fine. Um, and it gave you all this offense, like you just were able to take you know, hitter after hitter after hitter. You took a solid catcher in Cal Raleigh and even got two closers in, in the seventh and eighth round. Like, so by taking pocket aces, it really allowed you to, to make for a strong team everywhere else. I, I think people often get afraid of taking pitchers in the first two rounds because they're like, where am I going to make it up? And, and you did it by like staying the course and by not taking a third starter and a fourth starter. And then all of a sudden be like, oh, gee, like I've got this great rotation, but I'm never going to make up the offense. Like I, I look at your roster, I feel like you made up the offense and, and then some. 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I I think a lot of things fell into place here that I wouldn't always expect to fall into place quite the way um, that they did. I, sometimes you get an outlier result. I mean, we did this before Cody Bellinger returned to the Cubs, so he fell a little further than expected. Um, Churio, Churio versus Langford was actually the toss-up for me. I'm surprised Langford went three rounds later. That was a great pick by Alan Harrison in round 12, considering that Wyatt Langford now is jumping up ahead of Jackson Churio pretty consistently. Uh, but what I what I was looking at before going back into pitching was trying to decide how much quality was left at each position. Where was there going to be a massive drop where it was going to cost me? If I got to the point where there wasn't much of a difference between a handful of hitters that were available at the positions of need, then I flipped the switch back to starting pitching. But it just kind of fell where every every time I came back up, I looked at it. There was a clearly like obvious value bat relative to the others available at the position. So I kept going that way. Uh, I I think the other thing I would say about the pocket aces is it was an idea. It wasn't the idea. It was just a thing that I thought I would do if things broke a certain way. There was probably better than 50% chance if Ellie De La Cruz was sitting there with my second round pick, I just would have taken Cruz instead and would have come back and grabbed like Tyler Glass now or one of the other pitchers that I think is a possible SP1 in round three. And the build changes a little bit from there, but it's not radically different. You'd still have to um, go pretty aggressively with bats where I did. Um, How committed are you to a particular strategy ahead of time? Are you you kind of like, here's my A plan, here's my B plan, here's my C plan, and then Now let's watch what happens with the board. Or are you a little more rigid in what things you're trying to accomplish by each sort of checkpoint in the draft? I I mean, the only rules I really have are, you know, the one I just mentioned, like I try to get three starting pitchers in the first seven or eight rounds. I do try to take my first closer in the first nine or 10 rounds, even if I'm not going for a high end closer. Otherwise, I'm pretty flexible. I, like two years ago in Tout Wars Mixed Draft, I know you're in the, on the auction side or you were on the auction side. I, I won with pocket aces there. Um, I was at the 12 slot. I'm not going to you know go through a whole draft from you know, a year and a half ago but or two <laughs> years ago at this point. But it, it was a similar thing. I wasn't necessarily planning to, to go pocket aces, but with each pick, it just really, really kind of worked out for me. And you know, outside of that was a lockout year, like outside of taking Will Smith, um, as the pitcher, as a closer, like five seconds before he got traded. And, you know, I, I kind of had to like struggle for saves. Like it, it really worked out. Yeah. I think if you're only chasing one thing, you're going to generally be okay. Right. I mean, you, you're doing well in nine categories. That's usually enough to win a league. You don't have to be perfect across the board. That's something that um, I, I don't know why when I started playing, I, I tried to just win every category. It's like, that's almost impossible and almost sets you up to to make a few mistakes that you don't need to make by by just worrying too much about 10 categories instead of cutting it down a little bit and thinking about okay like here's my relative weakness i'm okay with it i'll try to address it here if that doesn't work that's fine we can move on and everything will be okay Oh, I was just going to say before we go, I mean, to date myself, I, you know, the first year I played, I did something, I don't know if you ever heard of it, called the Sweeney plan, which Mm -hmm. is like an old four by four strategy where you dump power. Uh, And I did it because I came into a league that had like, I had no freezes and I had to do something different. So I'm kind of the opposite. I've always played around with dumping categories, like when I have to, just, just to see if it can work. Yeah, man, no, no reason not to try something different, especially in those unusual situations. Taking over in a keeper league where you don't have a lot on your roster, that's a time for experimentation because it's going to take you a couple of years to probably make a good sustainable team, but you might as well have some fun and learn a couple of things while you try to go through that rebuild. Mike, before we go, uh, let our listeners know where they can find your work. Well, I'm at Baseball Prospectus. I've got two articles a week there. Um, I'll be doing a fab column once the season starts. Uh, I'm, we have our own podcast, me and John Hegland, our, our podcast partner, John, is not currently writing for BP, but he's a great player as well. He won one of the two GFBIs one year, uh, Flags Fly Forever. And I'm on Blue Sky right now. I'm no longer on X Twitter, but I'm on Blue Sky at Mike Gianella. I, I see more and more fantasy people are coming over there. So hopefully you'll, you'll join me over there. We can keep talking about baseball. Yeah, nice to see more folks going over there. Lots of ways to uh, engage about baseball without being on Twitter. It's part of the reason why we launched that Discord when we did, too. It's nice to to hang out with people that want to talk about baseball and you don't get uh, caught up in 
the mess that has become Twitter over the course of the last <laughs> decade. Uh, on our way out the door, if you don't have a subscription to The Athletic, you can get one. $2 a month for the first year at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Mike, thank you so much again for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Anytime, DVR. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Wednesday.